So what I'd like to do is talk about the Tianjin uh, Chao Tai Folk uh, Finance Center or CTF. And maybe to put it in a little bit in, in context um, uh, of, a, of this project as a tall building, um, talk about it as we refer to it as SOM as an ethos of integration. Um, I've had the pleasure and really the kind of uh, great um, responsibility to be working and to have worked on a number of buildings uh, throughout the world and particularly China as many of people that um, will be on this panel have, um, particularly in terms of the great sort of urbanism that's been happening and uh, the drive for density. Um, a little bit about, about that experience though, is that uh, oftentimes, you know, we're working with a severe series of constraints uh, that do with the height, uh, the plan, the efficiencies, and oftentimes um, uh, reduced to working on the exterior walls uh, and envelopes to give the building identity and certainly deal with environmental issues uh, of its locale. Uh, sometimes it's used with uh, views and uh, form, uh, the context of the neighborhood. Uh, we certainly uh, look at these envelopes very seriously in terms of dealing with um, shading, uh, solar gain, glare. And um, sometimes we're able, lucky enough, to start to configure these buildings so that the experience of being in tall buildings is uh, truly a, a unique one, uh, whether or not it's engaging the sky, uh, and as, as in the series, these pleats, uh, actually in a tower intention that we did earlier or uh, even trying to break up the building in a series of balconies and, and um, uh, breakout spaces that happen in the seams of this single building that is divided into four quadrants. Uh, sometimes uh, the exterior wall becomes uh, more sophisticated and obviously with uh, the drive for natural ventilation, uh, an idea of environmentally a responsive wall to harsh east and west, yet also breathable um, and uh, without um, dealing with operable windows with, with, with ventilation, natural ventilation into the walls are some of the ideas we've been pursuing. But uh, one of the things that I've been interested in personally and, and have um, um, joined with others in our office is really the idea of uh, engineering and particularly structural engineering as a um, uh, strong motivator, a strong determinant of form. And with been lucky to being able to complete a series of buildings and, and actually propose a series of buildings that deal with this idea of skin and bones, or as we say, sometimes making engineering visible. And this, this idea of, of um, thinking about different structural systems to either deal with strength, seismic, gravity, uh, wind, um, uh, interstory drift, uh, or taking the idea of um, structure and really using it to provide something that uh, enhances the programs in this exoskeleton, a way that there would be a loose fit for those residential um, uh, villas or homes that might exist within it. Or maybe uh, perhaps a new Chicago school uh, building upon the ideas of Hancock in terms of those mega braces or taking the idea of those um, uh, mega braces and bringing them down to the ground, uh, ideally to create uh, potentially a great sort of open space to the ground where you're able to clear out the core uh, and create public space as part of the public realm of the city. Potentially the structures can um, um, be adapted to uh, respond to multiple buildings and link towers. Uh, and so these ideas uh, have continued to um, uh, drive our practice uh, and uh, cause us to think about how can form uh, programs, structure, and performance be tied together in a way that would be um, manifested in the design of the tall building. For this early competition that we did um, for the Jingling Hotel, it was about looking at program and how, how the programs in a tall building might be optimized and how, the, how that form of the building doesn't start out as a willful shaping, but really responds to this case, the need for more perimeter. And can you actually then integrate it with a, a structural system, which was a diagram in this case, 
or as a trans bay tower, looking at a way to really optimize and think about the tall building as a cantilever using the Mitchell Trust and bring it down to the four corners, opening it up for a great gateway to the transit center that's adjacent. So the, the structure engineers uh, and the architectural teams at SUM, I think are really integrated and collaborative, thinking about how to uh, generate new forms that aren't, again, sculpture objects, but oftentimes think about uh, optimized construction. In this case, a cooling tower as a very fast, understandable way to create a shell um, that then is configured with genetic algorithms to think about uh, the right form for a one kilometer tower. Hollow in the inside uh, with cantilever floors, mixed use, and using both the outside skin as well as interior spaces as a way to think about the tall building. And can you achieve something in this idea of performance uh, that also includes the idea of beauty? And so this integration and optimization uh, uh, courses through all of our work daily. We constantly talk about it. Uh, and not only do we seek to use it in our practice, but we also strive to do research and try to understand uh, more about what we could do, particularly with tall buildings. And so for this project, uh, which was a competition, it was a rare example for us to take many of the ideas that we've been studying in terms of uh, a strong core that could be um, hollow in certain places or configured very tight in others. Um, a skin that started to think about uh, the qualities of, of uh, optimizing that floor plate, reducing the spans of the corners and trying to drive an idea about those spaces that exist not only outside the core, but also inside the core. And it was interesting for this competition, one of the great benefits for us was not only to explore these different ideas and really energize the team, but also discover other, other significant uh, areas for further research. In this case, the idea of wind. And so um, the group uh, led by Marcia Keyes and Bill Baker uh, with a great series of engineering directors uh, have uh, embarked on ideas of how do you develop a series of sets, a series of tools that might be used and um, developed to meet and, um, and, and work with some of the ideas that architects were generating, including a wind tunnel, uh, which uh, I think um, has been talked about earlier as being a way for us to get in early in terms of particularly tall buildings. How do they operate uh, in uh, wind conditions that, as we know, oftentimes govern um, the forces uh, and the requirements, requirements of the structure. So for our, the Tianjin uh, Chao Tai Folk or CTF Finance Center, um, we were approached by New World Development, uh, which is the subsidiary of New World China Land, as well as their retail operations, K11. And now also, I forgot to mention the Rosewood hotels as part of the group uh, to look at a new tower uh, for the city of Tianjin. Uh, it was interesting circumstance and Carol had asked uh, me to kind of describe a little bit of something of um, how these things came in the building and the dynamics of our work with our clients. And so in 2010, uh, I was approached by um, uh, New World uh, in terms of participating in a competition. Uh, and the competition would be for two sites, one would be in Guangzhou, one would be in Tianjin, and both of them would be a 200, excuse me, a 500 meter plus tower. And the catch was uh, that for these two sites, there would be a limited number of competitors. I can't remember if it was four or five, and that you had a great chance of doing, uh, of winning the competition, uh, Brian. And so um, we thought about it. Uh, but because of the terms, you know, of uh, the competition and the risks that we um, were um, um, facing, um, basically a no pay competition, um, and also coming off of a competition that we had lost, uh, we politely declined uh, to, you know, take on that opportunity, which was uh, a, obviously a tremendous one. 
Uh, interesting thing is a year later, uh, they came back to us and said, well, we've started with one. Uh, and that happened to be KP Upbuilding in Guangzhou, which is a lovely building. Uh, but we're having a little bit of issue with uh, the Tianjin project. And would you be willing to come back in and, and work with us on this, on this project? Um, I made sure it wasn't a competition uh, because knowing oftentimes when there's a condition of a competition and people can't decide, usually there's something as an issue. And so we assembled a team and these are, these are some of the main players. I apologize to anybody that's watching that's not on the list. Um, and some of the people on the list joined us a little bit later, but the team was really assembled um, to complement the very, very talented men, men, men and women of SOM, uh, particularly Chicago office, but certainly the resources of the firm uh, to embark in this, uh, this project, which um, we said we would step in and um, uh, work on the project if we we're able to do a series of workshops uh, to first uh, understand the problem, uh, including the place, and then get at a condition where we're engaged uh, with New World uh, directly to, so that it wasn't really a competition or beauty contest. It was really something more about trying to think about ideas uh, that might resonate with them. So the first part of it was really understanding the place. And Carol mentioned uh, Tianjin as being a, a big city. Uh, it's actually a region that is about 15 million people uh, that is really part of a greater Beijing Tianjin region of that uh, probably totals over 30 million people. So it's quite a bit larger than New York. Um, and it's um, really part of uh, several of the mega districts uh, or mega regions that exist within China that are being developed by the, by the government to take on the kind of rapid urbanization. Uh, in Tianjin, there's a uh, coastal portion of it called the Binhai area, uh, which is um, uh, a place where uh, SOM has had the opportunity to do several master plans um, that have dealt with um, this uh, new area that is part of the development zone um, uh, that uh, is about manufacturing, um, shipping, as well as being a series of new urban centers. And each of these urban centers really are cities in themselves. And the kind of red outline shows um, the area that, that we were working on called the TEDA, uh, T-E-D-A, TEDA area, which was something that actually SOM uh, participated in a little master plan in this area here um, very early in my career and actually was built as a, as a master plan of a series of parks, residential, excuse me, residential, er, residential area with a series of parks that support the kind of inclusive form of commercial development in that master plan. So the region is well, well uh, networked together in terms of the roads and the expressways and, and access uh, points uh, throughout, uh, threading throughout the district. Uh, it has good um, transit. A high speed rail now connects back to Beijing uh, in a very quick way before it used to take, uh, I think it was over four hours. Now it's about an hour, hour, hour train ride um, uh, to this, uh, from Beijing to this district. And it also has a, a future of, of um, transit to connect the sites throughout the districts. And one of the things you might, you might notice is that uh, in the district, it's really part, a subset of a larger um, area um, that has a series of plans, master plans um, adopted uh, that would provide the density that is gonna be satisfying the growth of China. Uh, our tower wasn't going to be the tallest. Uh, it actually was a again, a sister tower to the Tola Tower that would be happening in the Yujaipu district. So that relationship as a marker uh, of this, um, this, uh, this part of the, the district, uh, its own little city within the city was part of the idea of this project. And so the master plan in this exclusive form shows kind of development areas around um, the, the project with a kind of uh, set uh, idea and many existing buildings of commercial, um, residential, retail, office, uh, hotel, hospitality uh, development. And our project site had great access. Uh, it was uh, within a walking distance of many of the existing facilities and, and uh, favored facilities, including transit, major transit station, as well as, as well as the subway stations adjacent to it. 
in this mixed-use district uh, was quite vibrant in one of the earlier developments uh, that exists within this Binhai area. So the uh, existing um, um, or the, the, the project had a plan done by another architect and engineer, uh, which is shown here. This is uh, probably um, some of the earlier uh, images of it, uh, which showed a very tall tower uh, adjacent to the open space and surrounding developments. Uh, and it was very simple, uh, elegant design, uh, something that you know, I didn't know really what the issues are. And I still haven't uh, ever seen the final design. Uh, it had a plan that was generated um, uh, earlier that they said was approved and we need to, to uh, uh, conform to that plan. Uh, and so we actually just thought about it in terms of the context, uh, particularly the large park and try to make it uh, not only porous, uh, but also uh, reach out to the intersections we, which we knew uh, would be where the people would be coming from. Uh, and so, so the, the podium and the ground level plans are quite simple uh, in terms of that porosity and the access points um, and thinking about the different uses for the tower, which would be hotel, uh, service apartments, office, and, uh, and retail that would exist there. And so there's a um, podium condition for a shopping, um, um, a shopping center that would be uh, developed by K11, which again is part of New World's uh, retail development, uh, innovative in many ways uh, and trying to lead uh, the next thoughts about what retail might be uh, in China. And it was connected to the tower in several levels in order to, to form that relationship of the mixed use to the office, residential and hotel development. Um, the K-11 is supposed to be opening or had opened uh, in October, 2020, but I hadn't heard the last of it. And unfortunately due to uh, pandemic uh, and no travel, you know, we've kind of lost a little bit of touch of exactly what's happening, but we suspect that that it is uh, ready to open, but it hasn't, hasn't already. So this, this plan of a single tall building, um, 500 meter plus, um, the kind of large retail center that connects uh, not only at grade to the park, but also below grade to the network of other spaces was quite a simple party. And so we thought about the project and recognized that this place, uh, this place of Tata, uh, really was looking for a regional marker, something that would be distinctive, something that would uh, give it some identity. Uh, and at the time, um, we really didn't know uh, how tall were we in, in relationship to other tall buildings um, um, in China being developed. And obviously you can see that, you know, in 2011, uh, we're quite out, out of date now in terms of the, the really the explosion of super tall buildings that have happened since. But um, we did uh, get increased to 530 meters and then went to uh, New World and tried to think about how to um, speak about the project in terms of its um, narrative um, and what it was supposed to be doing and accomplishing. Now, one of the interesting things about um, clients and many of you know this, uh, that deal with clients is that they're oftentimes looking for a story. Uh, and that story uh, could be aspirational, uh, inspirational, um, sometimes emotional. And, and how does it, uh, um, how does a project create a certain atmosphere or feeling that, that might um, resonate with, um, with the leadership? Um, it's sometimes diametrically opposed to how we work, which is oftentimes rational. <laughs> And, and thinking about efficiencies and typologies of tall buildings. But we thought that we would uh, present a number of ideas very quickly, things that we have uh, done before, we've seen, or we have th had thoughts about in terms of some of the research or practice that we've been doing before. And you might recognize some of these forms from some of the earlier buildings that I described. Um, and then showed up uh, to present to leadership with a series of schemes they're really quite different, all meeting the same area, um, and um, uh, but then telling a different story about what the building uh, was trying to portray as its image and identity uh, in this place. Um, the leadership was really um, uh, um, led by Dr. Henry Cheng, a very smart man, a very seasoned developer, 
uh, and he um, gave us some very strong input in terms of what he thought would be uh, the kind of building uh, intuitively that he thought would be efficient, uh, uh, have a, uh, a chance of being built, um, but also something that would have uh, some originality and something that would be unique in terms of what he hadn't seen before or what he thought might be appropriate for Tianjin. And so we went off and then started to look at each of these three buildings in terms of uh, the layouts and efficiencies and how they might work as, as office buildings, uh, how they might work as residential uh, and how they might work as hotels. We also did some, uh, I had some ideas about how the stacking might, might happen in terms of that office, residential and hotel, uh, the very different heights, even goes so far as to start to explore vertical transportation, uh, as well as um, just the uh, efficiencies of the form itself in terms of surface area, uh, volume, and the ideas of how you might actually enclose that area. We also did uh, structural analysis of each of the three schemes, thinking about material quantities, uh, as well as kind of performance in terms of wind, construction speed, whether or not it had to have outriggers or not, and then just a little bit about um, you know, the, the number of columns and, and, um, and foundations. And so of the three schemes, um, you know, it was a, quite a bit of discussion and you know, uh, an interesting sort of back and forth, which we actually really appreciated and really gave some insight in terms of how our developers thought, um, uh, but actually more importantly, uh, how um, they thought uh, the towers would be received by both um, not only professionals, but also by um, the public and the government and selected um, the tower on the right, uh, which was a, a form that, that you might recognize it had something to do with a um, uh, previous tower that we had uh, discovered some interesting things about. And so we were happy about this thing because it, it represented a, a form that was both, we thought, um, potentially highly efficient. Uh, it had some interesting things about how it could enhance the programs and really support the programs in, within, uh, but it had a quality uh, that um, was very lyrical uh, and had a, a quality that um, was very fluid, uh, something that um, was um, not uh, what we thought of as a usual tower. And so um, we had some preliminary discussions, not only um, with uh, construction people, uh, that certainly the internal team, but also exposed this with um, the, the um, Tianjin and Tata government uh, and got actually a resounding uh, approval in terms of, of um, enthusiasm for this tower forum as being something that would give the place uh, a very strong identity in relationship to the greater district. And you see that the tower itself, um, you know, in its con conception um, of this object that is very soft uh, in terms of its form coming down to the ground uh, and then connecting to a very public uh, podium condition that was tied into the, to the um, public realm of the ground plane blow grade and other activities uh, around it. So look, thinking about the, the form, uh, what gave us a uh, great sort of enthusiasm for it was because we, we believed that um, the, the programs that were required of the office, uh, hotel and residential had something to do with um, um, an idea of how to shape the building. And just simply um, stated is that the office building, because of its bigger core and need for larger lease spans of 10 and a half to 15 meters, um, required a bigger floor plate, whereas the hotel and service departments uh, could adopt that same floor plate going all the way up, but then it would mean that you would have void spaces within the tower atria or those the kinds of cutouts. And so by taking, uh, thinking about that core um, diminishing, collapsing in, and also collapsing in the kind of lease span to about 11 meters plus a quarter, uh, we had a, a taper of the optimized form. And that if you then kind of tried to smooth that taper out, you would have a section of the large floor place down below and then a smaller floor place up above 
uh, for the hotel and residential. And the trick here was that at that transition um, between the larger floor plates and the smaller floor plates is that we would put not only in mechanical and area refuge floors, but also the sky lobby for the hotel as well as the sky lobby for the service apartments. And the service apartment sky lobby is right next to it, but the sky lobby for the hotel as well as some of the hotel amenities is actually quite separated uh, by the entire stack of service apartments to the hotel that, that exists above there. And we rationalized that once you're in an elevator, you really don't know how far you're going. But what it did do, it gave us a chance to drop off uh, those elevators that existed to serve that, sky, that hotel sky lobby, meaning that you could actually really get a tight and very efficient core uh, continuing up. And we continued to do massing uh, refinements with the plan. And there was a, a tremendous series of studies that the team uh, very expertly uh, and diligently worked on to um, uh, decide on the floor plate sizes and then see how that floor plate size resulted in an assing uh, of the tower. And so you can see that uh, the core is quite large. It's about a 3,600 square meter floor plate at the lower levels of the office with great lease spans and then a, a series of rounded corners to minimize that, that span uh, and give a, a certain softness uh, potentially even a sense of more corner offices to the to the to the floor plate uh, as it rises up you can see that the core uh, still uh, maintains itself and starts to drop away uh, but still for very good very good office spaces uh, and areas that that um, um, uh, will really be quite efficient for the office office portion uh, as it goes up then it transition transitions into the apartment zone which is a little bit less than 2,000 square meters um, with good lease bands to the, the residential areas, not making them too deep, too deep, where you would lose that kind of sense of daylighting um, uh, to the, the rear parts of the unit. Um, and also, you might notice that the, the tower, in addition to having shared elevators for some of the smaller units, for the corner larger units start to have private elevators that existed in each of the, the corners. So we're able to take this idea of, of um, maximizing not only the efficiency of it, but really giving it, um, giving those programs uh, from that sky lobby straight up uh, with private elevators uh, can really give it a sense of privacy and exclusivity. Uh, the hotel zone above it, uh, as you can see, it continues to uh, up, um, continues to draw in on the corners but with a similar lease span of about 11 meters um, with a very tight core that um, um, corresponds to the tapering of the plan. Uh, and here the two diagrams show the program stack of the office, service apartments and hotel with the step core within the core of the telescoping core. And so when we started to think about the structure for this, this project, obviously there's great interest in uh, diagrids in terms of their efficiencies. Uh, and you know, with our project that had this taper, could you actually develop something that was um, not a kink diagrid, but something a little bit more fluid, something that had a softer transition, had the diagonals uh, at the lower portion really, really needed it, but then actually did not have the diagonals at the hotel, the service departments where they would conflict with the views to the surrounding area. And so looking at a series of uh, conceptual structural systems, um, engineers really did a very fine job in terms of evaluating um, the different systems of core and mega brace or core and moment frame, frame tubes, outriggers, or even uh, steel plated shear walls, which we had used in the previous Tianjin project, and tried to evaluate these projects, I mean, these schemes, in terms of both the ductility and redundancy. Now, the, the secret here for the project was that as we start to get into the wind tunnel, and looked at each of the different options and shapes, we really discovered something that was uh, quite uh, important, is that the preliminary wind tunnel test showed that the curved corners and the tapering form dramatically reduced the wind loads. And that, that quality of, of the softened corners um, easing um, the, the, the sharpness of the corners and, and reducing um, the amount of vortex shedding that would occur, that would cause the building to potentially sway if it actually was so great, was something that happened not only in plan, 
but also in section in terms of that tapering tower. And then you add the, the other thing that we discovered, which was uh, the top of about 84 meters that was um, slightly porous. We also could reduce the wind loads and minimize that wind induced acceleration. And so looking at a different number of different tops, we obviously explored ways that we could actually have that porosity and yet still maintain an idea that the, the tower was a, it was a singular object and had a kind of cohesiveness to the form. So this idea of uh, aerodynamics in terms of shape finding was fairly significant for us because if you look at the chart on the right, um, the previous scheme, if you use that as a baseline, we almost had a 70% reduction in both the accelerations, uh, predicted accelerations, as well as about 69% reduction in the, waste, in the wind base moments. And that, that idea of actually that much reduction due to just the building shaping was something that allowed us to then further optimize and refine column spacing, which was 4.5 meters at the residential because that's what the residential module, down to nine meters at the, at the base uh, for the office. Um, we also looked at uh, wind vents uh, and as well as uh, de generating different tops and massing. Uh, interesting thing for us is that when we were looking at the wind vents, they actually didn't add that much uh, reduction in the, um, um, the lateral forces, the wind forces. Uh, we think partly because the building already was such a strong performer in terms of its uh, shaping. So the core um, plus the moment frame, plus the kind of sloping columns and belt trusses at the perimeter gave us this composite system with no outriggers. Uh, we had the, the tapering core, excuse me, not the tapering core, but telescoping core, where it was bigger and then drops off in the inside with a smaller interior core leading up. We had a series of slope columns that had very strong uh, lateral stiffness. Uh, they were CFT or concrete filled tubes uh, that existed and allowed us to have a very efficient uh, construction that then eliminated the idea of outriggers, which uh, many engineers would tell you really slow down the construction of a, of a building. And so we only had belt trusses periodic, periodically at the floors. We had a series of sloping columns that transition, uh, had a smooth transition over a number of floors and that uh, avoided um, uh, strong axial lows in a particular part of the building. And through the um, um, a strong um, building information model modeling, uh, we're able to really generate some of these complex forms, not only with ourselves, the design team, but also with the construction team. And it's really truly amazing uh, uh, construction, uh, the size of the columns, as well as kind of the complexity of some of these things that went together quite well. So one of the big things about this is that uh, any developer will tell you that, you know, um, a beautiful form is fine and dandy, but if you can't make it work, um, you know, it's not worth anything. And so one of the very interesting things for us was to take the metrics from the previous design and just think about uh, what we can do to improve it. So what we have is, is a larger floor plate at the base, uh, spreading the feet kind of stance of the tower a little bit broader to improve, it, improve its efficiency, not only from a structural point of view, but also from a just an efficiency uh, from an office point of view, office program point of view. It starts to taper in more dramatically uh, in the middle portion uh, where we have the service departments. Um, we think a little bit better units because those units aren't quite so deep as well as still having the private elevators and the kind of softened corner was more consistent lease span. And then also a smaller floor plate for the hotel up above that gave us a chance to also uh, taper that building further uh, with no loss of efficiency. In fact, we actually um, um, had a building that was um, uh, of equal height, equal area, a little bit more floors, uh, but much, much, much less weight, uh, smaller mat, and smaller number of piles. Uh, and with that increased efficiency and less weight and better performance, uh, and this particular, uh, we think, very innovative structural system, we thought we were able to uh, reduce the amount of materials from previous scheme. And these are just generalized numbers, but enough for the contractors and the clients to verify that we would re reduce it by almost 19,000 tons 
of steel, 10,500 cubic meters of concrete, and 3,900 tons of rebar. So it was really very significant. Uh, I have to say at first, I don't think the clients, uh, particularly in engineers, believe this, but once they, they really study the scheme, they became the biggest supporters. And I have to thank them for really supporting the idea of the project and driving it forward and completing it um, uh, to uh, a great deal of expertise and hard work. Uh, something that uh, certainly when you think about that amount of material being saved, uh, it represents a significant amount of money. Certainly uh, enough to, um, and I can't speculate how much because of prices of steel, but you know, between 35 and $40 million is something that, you know, it's order of magnitude that certainly would make it worthwhile to continue to develop a scheme. And so with this kind of very interesting and we think innovative form, uh, we then thought, thought about how do you actually uh, both uh, deal with the environmental aspects of enclosure and nature and uh, weather, um, uh, maintain the views, but also uh, do something that uh, was um, integrated and cohesive, um, both rigorous as well as um, had a, a certain degree of beauty. Uh, and so this, this wall was developed uh, with, um, with, uh, within the SOM uh, using many of the software um, um, uh, that is part of uh, the tools that we use, including, including CATIA, uh, thinking about how the, the uh, panelization, the mapping of that surface might happen. Um, some earlier thoughts show that there would be something on the, along the order of magnitude about 11,000, you know, 500 uh, different um, number of panels, 11,500 panels. Uh, and actually, I think there's some numbers at almost 13,000 panels. But that through uh, careful modeling and continued sort of working of the geometries and um, uh, push pull points, we're able to reduce the amount of unique units. Uh, each of the special units that are by themselves unique down to 476, which is a significant um, uh, difference uh, in terms of the amount of total number of panels. So that, that entered into um, um, the client's mind as being something that was cost effective, uh, certainly a challenge uh, for everybody uh, all around, uh, not only the clients, but also the subcontractors as well as design team and engineering teams. Uh, to realize, but a, a great step forward in terms of trying to understand uh, how to, to take this complex surface uh, and then now we map it to find uh, efficiencies uh, in that process. Um, when we start to look at the amount of these panels, the amount of um, protrusions or the kind of offsets uh, from the corners because of the doubly uh, curved surface, uh, we found that we could actually get almost 98.7% or less than 55 millimeters uh, out of plane. And so that led to the discussion about whether or not we would pursue co-bending uh, on the tower or not, uh, in terms of um, idea that you would take the, the glass <clears throat> and push a corner in uh, on site um, to snap it into place and have that, that unit be under a slight stress, which would be uh, uh, ideally within industry standards. Uh, we've done this before in other buildings uh, and had uh, success uh, not only uh, with the subcontractors and manufacturers, but also in terms of seeing some reduction in costs. But um, we had to actually do our own due diligence with New World and show them the differences between a uh, flat glass condition as well as a bent, uh, co-bent glass condition. And again, the co-bent glass condition on the left shows how that um, surface would be a smooth surface with um, uh, each unit that would be um, a, um, a deformed panel versus a flat glass condition. And you can see the slight ridges uh, or offsets in each one that would require a little makeup piece um, to uh, deal with um, that offset. Um, for many, many reasons, uh, after a lot of really rational discussion, um, the clients decided to go to the flat glass, uh, primarily because of, of not only what they uh, saw as uh, a risk in terms of glass failings, in terms of the ceiling, but also um, a long-term uh, risk um, in terms of um, maintenance. 
And so uh, what we did here was to then adapt, uh, uh, excuse me, develop a, a scheme where there was a SIL adapter and a transom adapter um, for the unit so that you could actually develop that condition where within the work points, you can get that offset um, um, uh, in the wall. And that meant that the, the millions then have this offset or inset uh, depending on its curvature of being convex or concave. And in that two, not only 240 millimeter mullion, uh, we're able to achieve a certain window wall ratio uh, that was actually a little bit surprising um, uh, of only 58% 50, uh, vision to solid, which meant that our wall tended to be higher performing, uh, not quite so much glass uh, that was um, discernible. Uh, but uh, after doing some mock-ups and seeing that wide mullion that then is beveled on the inside, it actually was quite beautiful in, in our minds in terms of the way the light hit that beveled surface and actually seemed like it was actually just an ordinary mullion from the inside. We also developed this idea of the mullion that st stacks on top of another unit to provide this offset. And that offset allowed us to think about the wall not as a grid, but more as a fabric uh, of these uh, wide mullions catching the light um, with that um, condition that has the, the small rounded half round corner um, that almost operated as a bow nose, a reverse bow nose uh, that had an integrated light uh, in the base of it uh, to uh, create this wall that was really uh, what we think of as a kind of beautiful uh, fabric like curtain. Uh, draped over the surface of the structure. And so this is the building that is um, substantially completed uh, in, uh, I think, the fall of 2019. Uh, they had a, um, a ceremony. They continue to work on the um, uh, residential portions, which would be completed in 2022, as well as the hotel. That's one of the brands of the Rosewood Hotel that also be completed in 2022. But you can see that the, the kind of um, beautiful uh, shaping, both those concave and convex surfaces match the structural diagram uh, with a large sloping mega column uh, right behind that groove with that detail between the concave and the convex surfaces. Uh, here's a close up of the wall itself uh, with a bronze like um, um, anodized aluminum. Uh, we are looking for a a warmer uh, coloration of the, of the wall that's almost champagne-like in terms of its um, tonality. Uh, and it's very interesting what happens uh, in the, both the typical condition as well as places where we allowed uh, mechanical um, openings to occur. Um, that the quality of that, that wall combined with the base that happens with it, the podium base happens with it, uh, oftentimes changes color uh, and oftentimes takes on the, either the hue, the hue of the sky uh, the hue and coloration of the glass or starts to take on its own kind of sparkle uh, itself. Uh, these are some images of the base of the building. Uh, and you see that even in different times of day, uh, it has kind of a quality where that, that fabric, that's, that surface, uh, both undulating uh, in, its, um, in its verticality, uh, is quite beautiful. And so uh, we hope that uh, as the hotel is, is starting to be fitted out, those upper floors, which include um, restaurant, lounge, uh, special amenity uh, for the hotel, will be thought of as uh, public spaces for the city. Uh, on the top of the roof, there's actually this great sort of um, space that's partially open, uh, quite a beautiful public space uh, that could be developed. Um, and so this building, uh, we think, uh, does achieve uh, a quality where it certainly has thought about its context of Teda as being a city within the city, uh, marking the identity of this neighborhood within the larger district. Um, it start, starts to think about uh, the qualities of performance uh, in terms of its structure and efficiencies. Um, certainly that performance then is, is illustrated in terms of how it's uh, shaped from the exterior, uh, sitting within that, that city itself, both respecting the, the history of the city, but obviously looking forward to a, a new future for Tianjin 
and Tata uh, district. So the, the lyrical line, again, matches that, that structural concept and really is unique uh, to this building and not like we had um, thought about a, another structure or just thought about a, a building shape. Uh, when viewed from the different aspects of the neighborhood, whether it be from the countryside and open spaces or from the urban condition itself, uh, it presents really a strong identity that in the end uh, really did uh, exceed the client's expectations of what they thought this building might be um, uh, in the portfolio of tall towers within China. And uh, I love this photograph because it really starts to take on the quality of of how it changes within light, uh, becoming at times very atmospheric uh, and almost ether ethereal. Um, and as it sits within the skyline, uh, hopefully pointing to a, a new future about not only um, the city itself, but the integration of architecture and engineering. So with that, uh, Carol, I am finished. Thank you for that. It was a really extraordinary presentation. and. Um, I have to say that I thought that I understood the building pretty well before you began. And now with all of the details that you presented, I have so many more questions um, that, I, that I want to ask you. And in particular about those three schemes um, at the beginning uh, where the client gravitated towards the, the, the final presentation, but the other two shapes were so different. And um, one of the questions from the, from the audience had to do with uh, SOM's characteristic method of working. Um, he noted that SOM is well known for, uh, for integrating the architectural and engineering practice within one firm. Um, and uh, I know that so many of your, your schemes begin with a, a kind of, especially I mean, tall buildings, a, a structural idea, an idea, a, a, a clarity of structure as a typology that that can be adapted to individual um, clients and programs. And and you made very clear how the how the program affected ultimately um, the resolution of all the, the the changing floor plans and and the kind of you know rising rising shape. Um, but my question is about those other two schemes that you, that well six schemes at the beginning, but then the 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 two um, that 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 fell away. Did those represent an equally innovative structural idea um, that was an was an alternative that nevertheless fit yeah. the program well enough? I mean, what what were those two rejected schemes? I think the, the, the two, one was kind of a mountain-like um, configuration, lots of terraces. And it was a thought that, that um, it was something a little bit more romantic, uh, something that, that spoke not about machine-like aesthetic, but more about um, nature and the idea that you know, people could get out onto those surfaces or it would have a kind of a quality, a more naturalistic quality. Uh, and frankly, we did that uh, just really to push it to kind of an edge um, in terms of an approach, uh, maybe something more literary uh, and um, something that might be a little bit more about a certain kind of connection, um, you know, as a, as a story to that, that place. Uh, the other, the teardrop shape is something that we had been looking at um, in previous, frankly, previous designs. Uh, and it represented maybe another kind of um, edge to that range uh, in terms of really an optimized form that was very, very steeply tapering, uh, and, but it had a, a very, very strong, obviously geometric uh, cohesiveness to it. Uh, and you could see it in the kind of, some of the things I showed earlier, both the Kingdom Tower, as well as I know our New York office had, had done something uh, similar to that. So, you know, partly they, the ideas were at that time very quickly generated and they were meant to uh, really get at um, some response to the clients. And I think that uh, to his credit, uh, Dr. Chang um, saw something original in the other one and nobody really knew how it was going to sort out. Uh, and that's why he put us on the path to, to really keep uh, two others in the running. Uh, but once he saw that um, and the entire team saw that there was some virtue and the efficiency, but also in terms of a little bit the 
the idea that that efficiency and kind of rationality led to a certain beauty and uh, originality that I think they were wholeheartedly behind the scheme. Mm. Uh, and I was interested in what you said at the beginning about the, the, the client being interested in, in a story, kind of, you know, an image, uh, something that resonated with an idea about the company identity, I suppose. Um, what, was, what was the story of the, the finally selected design? That wasn't clear to me. Um. You know, that's, that's always one of the things that, uh, frankly, I'll just um, confess, oftentimes <laughs> trips us up, you know, me personally, you know, off, you know, many times I think um, the narrative uh, of a building uh, is um, something that could be many different versions of the same story. And so something that I might think of as narrative that has to do with um, solving problems, you know, dealing with how people live, work, uh, play within the building in terms of those programs, dealing with uh, how it's held up, dealing with how it's made, uh, dealing with kind of the place of that in terms of some abstract, abstract concepts that might be really different than somebody, a uh, man on the street, giving a building a nickname, you know, and um, people are very aware of uh, those nicknames and the kind of the ability to kind of um, make a, a building or a place a one-liner. And so you have to kind of negotiate that, that line in terms of uh, thinking about something that, you know, could resonate and kind of mean something to the everyday person, uh, man on the street, a woman on the street, you know, or to an expert in, um, in, uh, in tall buildings. Mm -hmm. I remember when I saw you in Chicago a couple of years ago at the conference and, um, with Bill Baker, and and it was either you or he that that described the building, the uh, Chow Tai Fook as a skyscraper with hips, which <laughs> is the tagline that we used in order to introduce your uh, your your lecture in our e blast. Um, do you do you find a kind of anthropomorphic quality to that form? Um, I think, you know, I, I personally don't actually, but I enjoy people's interpretation of it. Uh, I think partly is that I don't think uh, when you're, you know, uh, designing a building, you need to make it look like a, uh, uh, like a base necessarily. Um, you know, sometimes that, that works for other people, you know, for me, it doesn't. And so I think that that's kind of a personal, um, you know, sort of maybe sort of set of values by each designer. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, if you do something that is um, evocative enough that it has many different meanings and, and really responds to people, I think that that's when maybe you have discovered something that's very special. So, you know, um, I think that, um, you know, we heard from a party secretary, Communist Party secretary, that really was enamored with the project because I think partly it, it would... Um, bring great stature to him and his, um, his, um, his uh, uh, period of time that he's governing uh, in charge of the project. Um, but um, more importantly, he thought it was something that's quite beautiful and, and you know, not describable. You know, so people have said it's kind of very fluid and it looks like it's a, you know, a, a, um, uh, a, a sculpted, you know, uh, object by the wind. So, you know, whatever the interpretation is, I'm, you know, <laughs> I just said maybe I'm a loss to to kind of push it too far. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, you mentioned your your client, uh, New World Development. You, you might characterize them a, a little bit more for for the audience. Um, and you showed the KPF Tower in Guangzhou being the uh, the, the kind of um, sibling or what is certainly not identical twins, except in the 530 meter height. And I wonder what it was about the client's decision to make both of those towers of equal height um, that, that, that guided or changed um, anything about your design. Yeah, you know, I don't know the exact answer to that, but I suspect that it was a window where um, strong relationships um, between New World, which are very experienced uh, Hong Kong based developers uh, that worked uh, in Hong Kong many years and, and have been very successful in China. 
uh, with strong relationships with the government and approval agencies um, were, you know, they uh, were given approval to develop those two sites, one in Guangzhou and one in Tianjin at those two heights. Um, and, um, you know, it was not a, a um, you guys go off and do whatever you want to do kind of um, direction from the clients. It was very rigorous, very demanding. They have uh, people who are experienced uh, and know what to do. Uh, don't, you know, tolerate BS. Uh, and really want you to prove that that stuff out. So the combination of our expertise, uh, both in practice as well as research, uh, their expertise in building many, many buildings and understanding the, not only the, the kind of art of architecture and engineering, but also the logistics of getting something done, both con construction and approvals and materials and, and uh, you know, labor and all those things, uh, taking that, and combining it together in a collaborative uh, manner was something that I think led to the success of the tower. Again, it wasn't easy. Uh, we were challenged all the time, um, but when people finally discovered that it worked, uh, there was, then there was great support for it. And I think that, that um, sometimes um, I believe that you have to use a little bit of imagination um, in terms of what you wanna do, and then combine that with a very strong conviction in terms of believing that what you're doing is right and proving it out, but to the extent that frankly, you know, we lost money. You know, we didn't have to go the extra effort, but we felt it was the right thing to do, and uh, this could be something special and and part of the legacy of architecture, uh, these tall buildings uh, or the story of tall buildings, uh, and um, and then we won out in the end. So I think it's that that ability to to um, um, prove out and and stay the course. That was important for this project. And the, the shape of the tower is so unique and, and innovative. Do you think that there is, that there is a replicable model, um, a, some you know kind of future typology that came out of this particular experiment, or uh, or or is this uh, uh, an icon that you know will be um, you know a kind of a singular um, experiment? Well, we are, we are doing another project right now um, that has a similar idea of a tapering form, uh, softened corners to kind of reduce wind uh, along with the taper, uh, and then a structural system that has bracing um, at the base of the building straight and then some bracing at the top. And it's that, that idea is not you know, unique. I mean, there's other buildings that have done that, but uh, part of it is discovering, I think, uh, and working out the, the nuances of it, how do you kind of craft a building? Uh, and so that this other building will be, will look quite different. Uh, and uh, I think that it also would have um, a, uh, a strong connection to its place, uh, which is actually in Ningbo. So um, do I think that there's gonna be a great proliferation of these kinds of buildings? Actually, I don't think so because this building was complex um, to do and um, it may not be for every developer thinking about um, you know, the next big thing. We need to conclude in a, in a minute or two, but there were um, a few questions which I'll wrap into one. And a couple of people were interested in what happens below the ground level. Um, there was a question about parking and, and you know, how that is accommodated. Uh, um, and you didn't speak about uh, seismic uh, design issues, uh, though I think you're in a fairly high seismic zone. Yeah. Uh, there were additional questions um, that kind of, um, I guess you would put in the realm of uh, morality of uh, super tall buildings, either issues of inequality or, um, or labor um, exploitation and, and, and various other, I think, well-known areas of uh, discussion uh, about tall buildings, but, but the, the morality issue of sustainability um, and the use of materials you, would, you addressed in the, the material savings by engineering strategies. Um, but overall, um, how would, how, what factors of sustainability and climate do you think kind of wrap up into this general topic of, uh, of you know, skyscrapers and society? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think that uh, it's um, well known that tall buildings, super tall buildings are intense, ex intensive in terms of the use of materials. 
um, that balance of though in terms of providing that density in that specific place and then having that be a catalyst for a you know a uh, an urbanism or or an urbane environment of a walkable city and transit and mixed use um, you know I think that that story is being played out every day right now um, in particularly in China where they are uh, building cities at a great pace um, you know, there's, I think there was this is a fact that, that uh, you know, we were talking earlier about the, the amount of people that live in New York versus Tianjin. You know, I think that there was something like 10, 11, 12 cities in the United States, over a million people. And I think that there's something like 150 or something like that cities over a million people in China. In fact, there might even be more. I might have my numbers mixed up. But the fact that that's hard for North Americans to understand um, the idea of cities as being places of opportunity and to build cities, um, you know, in a responsible um, density is something that's being pursued there. Uh, central government is behind it. And um, that's what's happening with uh, developers, both Chinese as well as international developers. So to do it uh, in a way that um, optimizes, I think, um, certainly the efficiencies, you don't waste, uh, to build these things as, as light as possible and strong as possible, so you're not, you know, so you're conserving resources, and to do it so that um, it's using the least amount of energy. I think those are two stories that are being played out, particularly the energy, water, and waste story um, of these tall buildings. Uh, it is designed to lead gold, uh, but obviously many of us don't feel that's good enough, uh, and we should be looking for, you know, uh, zero carbon, uh, which is a, a big uh, task uh, for everyone, but I do think that that um, you know potentially the, the positive part of it that the, maybe the central government is able to initiate some um, rules that people have to follow to get towards a uh, a, a more uh, sustainable um, not only um, environment but also society. Um, you know. Getting back to the, the easy question and avoiding the, the tough morality question, uh, I didn't show any of the basements or any of that stuff because, uh, you know, it's obviously uh, very similar to many, many, many buildings around the world. Um, I mean, many buildings in China that do the same thing, which is uh, a number of parking levels and then extensive connected um, lower levels to adjacent properties. And so that connections, uh, particularly in a harsh climate like Tianjin, is very important. And, absolutely necessary for building a more cohesive network of um, circulation. Um, and then I think that, uh, what was the other one? Oh. Seismic. Oh, seismic, yes. Uh, well, you know, definitely high seismic area. And uh, what they found, what our engineers found though in studying it is that uh, they could solve seismic uh, if they solve for wind first. And so it is governed by the wind uh, and that there is a certain amount of ductility uh, in, the, in the frame that allows for um, uh, the forces not to be, uh, or the members not to be attracting too much forces and basically um, being too strong for that, that, uh, that region. And so all those things, I think there was a elastoplastic analysis done, which is some of you would know is like a really extensive uh, analysis of FU system uh, under multiple loadings. Uh, and so um, it's, a, it's a building that is uh, very, uh, sophisticated, and I'm sure that um, I think you mentioned that um, there's a CTUBH or even a, another presentation by people that are talking about the enclosures and this in the structural systems that would probably be uh, very informative. Well, we've um, we've gone over well over our time, uh, and uh, I just thank you so much for uh, not exhausting by any means the richness of uh, of topics um, and really the very the myriad extraordinary aspects of this design that I think is not well known uh, to many of us and um, I hope will be much, much better known uh, as, uh, as, as people begin to pay attention again to the other parts of the, of the world um, that aren't just um, in, in, our, in, in our most um, immediate um, uh, kind of focal length of view and our, our, um, uh, our, our news, news channel um, focus. Uh, so we hope we've achieved a little bit of um, both worldview um, as, as well as um, 
I suppose, local, ri local richness in understanding Tianjin better um, through your explanation. So thanks so much um, for this this evening and everybody um, come back next week as we look at Beijing um, and see uh, another, another set of um, ambitious, uh, both engineering and architectural aspirations. So thanks so much, Brian, for, the, okay. for doing this tonight. Thank you. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. Hello, everybody. It's six o'clock and welcome to the third installment of our Worldview Designing su uh, Global Super Talls. Uh, and tonight, as you can see on your screen at the moment, and um, you can see me, I will uh, do a short introduction of both the series and of our speaker tonight, Brian Lee, who's going to focus on uh, Tianjin CTF Finance Center, uh, a, a building just recently completed uh, in, in 2019 uh, in Tianjin a city about as large uh, as New York, the fourth largest city in China, but one that isn't that well known, I think, to most Americans. Um, probably a um, few of us have traveled there. I know that I haven't. Uh, it seems to be outside of the uh, kind of the, um, the, the well-known urban centers like Shanghai, Beijing, uh, Hong Kong, Guangzhou, Pearl River Delta. Uh, and Brian Lee has, has uh, built in all of these cities, um, but it was the uh, CTF Finance Center that I particularly asked him to focus on tonight. Uh, and as one of the featured buildings uh, in our exhibition, let me go to that um, slide that makes um, reference to the, the featured buildings in our show. Um, this worldview lecture series is a kind of companion piece and expansion of Super Tall 2020, uh, still not opened because of uh, uh, the, um, the, the tragic con consequences of, of 2020, but we hope um, this spring we will still be able to welcome the public uh, into the Super Tall show. Um, and uh, there we have in our cases a, a, a kind of featured selection of towers that I thought were the most interesting um, formal uh, engineering, kind of innovative um, shapes, technologies, uh, um, and um, uh, new paradigms for uh, super tall buildings uh, that we wanted to kind of pull out of the larger number of what the category we call super tall, 380 meters or taller, the height of the Empire State Building. Um, and you see in this picture, and we are featuring in each one of our, our lectures, uh, the, uh, the, the buildings that are featured uh, in, in the exhibition. And Jamie Von Klemper started our, our series with the building that you see on the far left, the China Resources uh, Tower in Shenzhen. Scott Duncan talked last week about Guian, uh, World Trade Center, and now we've worked our way to Tianjin. Um, the following week, next week, uh, Rob Whitlock from KPF will talk about the next building that, that you see in, in this lineup, uh, the Citic Tower or China Zun, uh, followed by Carl Fender from Melbourne, Australia. It's one of the, the advantages of uh, having webinars rather than in-person lectures is that we'll be able to draw literally um, from around the world and the other, other side of the world uh, when Carl joins us to talk about his design for Merdeka in uh, Kuala Lumpur. Uh, then we'll be uh, followed the, in the next uh, the next person in the series is Adrian Smith, who designed when he was at SOM, uh, the Burj Khalifa, and now in his own firm, the next building that you see over there, Chengdu, uh, Greenland Center, and then the Lakta Tower um, will follow it, uh, after the engineering series. So you can see from these um, uh, eight towers that there is a great deal of formal invention that has been playing out in uh, within this select category of the super tall typology. And um, I'll go on to uh, just show you um, to, to underscore the idea of innovation uh, and make reference to three categories in which uh, our building tonight, uh, uh, the Tianjin CTF, 
uh, is, uh, is among the finalists for the innovation awards, um, both for structural engineering, as you see here, and in um, construction. And then um, finally, and certainly not least, um, for architecture as the best tall building of 400 meters um, and above. So there you see the photograph of Brian Lee, who is going to uh, now uh, come on camera so that you'll be able to see both of us. And as I exit our screen, I will um, introduce uh, Brian. Uh, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Brian should appear. There he is, um, and I'm not seeing in the, him in the proper view, but um, hopefully you are seeing all seeing just Brian and I on the screen. And um, I um, am really delighted tonight that, uh, that Brian has been able to join us from Chicago because he's just driven across country from California in three days, including in the last bit in the snowstorm in the Midwest and, uh, and, uh, and arrived um, very early in the very wee hours yesterday. But um, Brian is, uh, has spent 28 years in the San Francisco office of SOM, uh, where he practiced as a partner and um, did uh, high rise and other projects around the world. And um, in 2007, so uh, 13 whole years ago now, Brian, um, he, um, he moved to Chicago where he's a, a partner uh, in, the, in the Chicago office of SOM. So uh, he has, uh, shared his screen a little bit with me and I know that he's going to show some of the earlier Chinese uh, high rise designs um, that he has been responsible for in order to give you a little bit of context about his um, uh, really extraordinary building uh, in Tianjin. So um, Brian, I'm going to turn it over to you. Oh, and I'm going to remember to tell people, if you have questions you can add to the chat now, I will collect those questions as they occur to you um, while Brian is speaking, and then I can moderate in the, in the Q&A um, when he finishes uh, his, his lecture. Um, if you wait longer than that, it may be harder to get your, your questions in or for me to be able to see them at all. 